welcome back to Getting to the Top, where we interview transformational leaders about their leadership journey in hopes that we can inspire you on yours and big goal to make the world a better place. So today I'm having a wonderful conversation with Lisa Ann Joseph. So Lisa's gonna to talk to us about two very different things. One, we're gonna to talk to Lisa Ann about her career as she came out of corporate and went into entrepreneurship. But we're also going to talk to her about the coaching that she does. So if you think about some major brands, she has coached leaders at those brands. And so, and, and quite often, very diverse leaders. And so it'd be interesting for us to understand, especially from her uh, unique perspective, what are some of the things that she teaches coaches and guides people through that would be important things for us to know as we're on our own leadership journey and pursuing the highest levels of leadership? Welcome, Lisa Ann. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I want you to... It, uh, introduce yourself in your own words so that we get a little bit about you and your background and the company that you have and then we'll we'll get into what the journey was like and then we'll get into some exciting stuff around um, your coaching. Excellent. Well, I own and operate one of the leading public relations and crisis communications agencies in Trinidad and Tobago and um we may even venture within the Caribbean. We can certainly compete within the Caribbean space uh, in public relations and crisis communications. It's a full service agency and uh, um, we have been in business for the last 14 years. So we are pretty much on our way uh, of becoming a Caribbean entity. Fabulous. All right. So now let's talk about how did you get on this journey? Where did you start? What, what were you doing first? Hmm. Interesting. I started in dance. My family's business was and still is in dance. Uh, my father is Eugene Joseph. Uh, for some people who may or may not know him, uh, my parents have been in dance since I was born and uh, they continue to do so up to today and they mm -hmm. too are still teaching and they're nice. pretty busy so I started there so I started the entrepreneurial journey since then it's a family business and a business that I'm still a part of wonderful so, so you had this you had the passion for dance or it was just like well I might as well do it mom and dad are in it well when you're born into it there's no question whether it's a passion or not it just kind of grows within you and you you just you know go with the flow and and, and, and and you just yes and you just do it you know uh so it's a passion yes uh I haven't done it let me say up front I have not danced in many many years so so don't ask me if you still dance and get out there no I don't <laughs> and what kind of dance did you do when you did dance well, I actually went to university to do dance. Oh, fabulous. I went to university to do ballet, modern dance and uh, switched midstream and did social sciences because okay. I realized that the dance world, even though my parents did very well and still continue to do so, I did not, uh, I wanted to do more. I wanted to do other things. And uh, I just pursued that, but I'm still part of the family business. And uh, they do a lot of uh, children's classes and a lot of ballroom and Latin. So that, okay. that's the space that we're into now. Excellent, excellent. I should talk to you about that offline. I, I used to teach sure. beginners Latin dance and I definitely want to get back into dance. And so it would be great to, to be able to take some advanced dance classes with my husband. Awesome. Yes. So, but so, so then you're, you're in school. So how, how does it, how do you decide to switch courses midstream and how did your parents take it? Well, I didn't tell them <laughs> for about two semesters. Nice. And uh, I just didn't know how to do it because, you know, when you're born into that, into any family business of so the expectation, and I'm the first child. Of how so many? the expectation of three. Okay. So the expectation was that I will go to university, come back and run the business and, you know, expand and, and, and do what you have to do in a family business. So that was the expectation. So I did not know how to switch 
well, to communicate that I switched um, midstream during uh, my, my time abroad. So uh, I eventually told them and they were fine with it. They understood it. Once I remain part of the business and I still am up to today. Very so nice. Very dutiful daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very dutiful, very loyal and very, very, very much into our business, our family business. And are your, is your brother and sister? Are they uh, two you? brothers, two, two brothers. younger brothers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they are in the business as well. Excellent. Okay. Yes. So then you decide you're going to pursue social sciences. And so you graduate. And then you, what, did you, what do you decide to do? Well, I came back to Trinidad. I did it abroad. And I came back to Trinidad and went back, well, went into the business because I just came back home. And my father was like, well, you're not going to come back home and not do anything or look for a job. There's a job waiting for you. So I went straight into managing the business and then I started to look for something within my field. Mm -hmm. And then public relations came calling. So um, I went with Family Planning Association. I was their PR officer at that time. I had no clue of public relations. And uh, so people asked me, well, how did you get into it? I, it found me. I didn't look for it. It found me. Uh, Hetty Sargent at, at the Family Planning Association at the time, she saw this young person who just came out of university, very hungry, very focused and, and wanted to, to learn. And uh, threw myself into, into this. And um, that was it. She, she taught me the fundamentals of public relations working in the Family Planning Association which as people may know, it's an NGO, with, local NGO with international links. You so know, I a, got that, that training immediately. That's a really interesting point because we talk a lot about leaders and, their, and on their leadership journey and how they lead and how they get to the highest offices. But we don't necessarily talk about how do you spot up and coming talents? How do you spot um, potential leaders, potential future leaders and give them those opportunities, especially when they have no experience and something as public facing as PR, I cannot tell you that I would have been as, as open and as ambitious to say, you know what, you're out of school. I think you can do PR for us. Yeah, yeah. It's a risk. To her it's credit. A risk. To her credit. And to her credit, and, and with, to which I'm very grateful. And uh, it's something that I see up to today. You know, how do you spot that talent? because it has come full circle because I now have to hire people for my company. Yeah. So it's, it's the same process. And I look for, and I think this is what she has told me as well. So I use the lessons from then uh, for my business. Now she has told me that, that she, she wanted someone that she can mold mm -hmm. and someone who wants to be mold, molded, mm -hmm. someone who is interested in, uh, in 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 the field i i mean i knew what public relations was but i never thought i wanted to do it so once i understood the fundamentals of it i said okay i i can deal with this and uh, she was able to to kind of guide me on that path and i gave myself to the the process you know people talk about trust the process mm -hmm. so luckily i had someone that i can put the, my trust in and and i was guided accurately yes. I yeah. was you know so. and it turned out to be your life's work your passion your exactly yeah exactly and she remains my mentor up to today and I uh, I have other mentors as well as I moved along my journey uh, all women interestingly and um, they too I trusted the process and uh, you know that's what led me so then from family planning where did you go I went to TCL group of companies. Mm. Uh, and that's from that Cement. Cement Limited. Yeah. Yes. With and and as their PR manager for the Caribbean. So oh no, so no, no. I missed out. I missed out something in between. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. no it, it's been <laughs> senior moment. So be uh, right after family planning, I went to First Citizens Bank. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I was just about to say, went, how long were you at family planning before you were ready to take on this regional role? For yeah, I was exactly. I was there for five years at, at FPA. 
And then I went to First Citizens as their PR, PR manager. And uh, uh, I stayed there for another five years. Mm-hmm. And that is where I, I really took the grounding that I got from the Family Planning Association and, and put it to use. Because now I went in as a, a manager. Uh, I didn't go into FP as a manager. I went in as an officer. Mm-hmm. So, but because it's such a small organization and because of who Hetty Sargent was, she forced you to, to manage and she forced you into the leadership position. Right. So I was well grounded to take up this position at First Citizens. And as their manager, it was also... Uh, very early after the merger of the banks, it, those the three banks. So, I, I'm you know you're talking about twenty something plus years ago. So <laughs> it's it's not recent. And at that time, the the banks had had recently merged. I think they were like two or three years into it. Mm-hmm. So there was uh, four cultures, as as I call it, each from the 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 um, banks prior and then the new first citizens culture mm. of which I was a part of. Right. So uh, in the PR managerial role, you had uh, four cultures to deal with. And it, it, you know, you know how when you are challenged, you're forced to grow up. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. That is what happened, you know. So moving from a small entity, family business, a small uh, uh, organization into a pretty large organization. Yeah, and it's, complicated it's, and, you know, heavily regulated. and That's yeah. correct. That's correct. And, um, you know, dealing with, there were, I think, uh, about 100 managers there at the time. Wow. And uh, the staff were in the thousands. Uh, um, so it was a lot to deal with. And, um, and you know, uh, this evolution of of a new bank that was on its way um so there was a lot to deal with yeah and uh we had no choice but to uh push through with this fourth culture this new brand this new entity this new way of thinking and and help uh those in within the organization internally and externally to uh with this whole process now, how much of the communications was internally focused versus externally focused, given that you were dealing with a merger, all kinds of different cultures coming together, all kinds of people who might have been worried and concerned about the future of the institution, their future individually? Was it mostly externally facing or was it a lot of internally facing? What was that distribution like? You know, as I reflect on it, I can't even say that it was evenly distributed. We just had to deal with it as it came. Mm. Because there were so many projects that were just overlapping each other that you had to to ensure that both internal and external audiences were were taken care of. Yeah. And that's the thing with communication. You have you can't necessarily say okay, uh I can I can divorce myself from this particular audience at this time, depending on the project, of course, right. but most of the times you have to deal with both internal and external. Yeah. There are other professions that can choose yeah. which audience they're dealing with and, and that's good for them. But on the communication side, and especially, you know, fast forward to now, and when I speak to women in leadership, we talk about communicating for various audiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, no one form of communication can work. It has always been, and it continues to be, uh, uh, a layered approach, a multifaceted approach in your communication. Unpack that for me. Yeah, and when you get, when you understand that and you 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 know how to deal with each audience as it is presented to you then you deal with it accordingly so, so for example, example perfect yes yeah. for example 
if you are any leader, male or female, and you're talking to the media, mm -hmm. know that you're not speaking to the media only. You're speaking using the media to your intended audiences. Mm -hmm. So depending on the issue, you may be speaking to your primary stakeholders. Yes. You may be speaking to um, your customers, but you may, be you may to also be to speaking your to, correct. You also speak to your employees. Yeah. You yeah. also speak to, let's say you operate in a particular community mm. and there's an issue within that community. When you go on the media, don't think that you're speaking to the wider public. Right. You're rarely speaking to the community as well as other stakeholders. Yeah. So that is one of the things that, that, that leaders need to understand. And I know I'm, I'm flouncing between my experience sure. and, 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 you know, the, the yeah. recommendations I give to, uh, to, to my clients. Right. While so how do you, yeah. How do you, how do you sort of sit and unpack that? So do you think about, okay, this is what I'm communicating and this is the audience that, that I want to reach, but here are all of the other people listening. And this is, do you sort of craft the message and then say, look at it through each lens or how do you, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, one tip I always tell them is visualize who you're speaking to at that mm. time. Okay. So line up all the people in your mind and say, okay, in your mind and how who, will they receive it? Yeah. And how, and, and how do you speak to them? Yeah. Because you may, you know, we always talk about using very simple language. But mm -hmm. when you, you look at, at leaders in, in various sectors, there's a jargon that's unique to that sector, yeah. that is unique to that company, that is unique to that managerial uh, space. Mm -hmm. When you're talking to external audiences, you can't use the jargon that you're using yeah. internally. Yeah. So you have to know. So I say to them, I said, okay, if you're talking to your mass public yeah. your customers you know if you're in retail and you're talking to to your mass customers um think about you're sitting in a Makti taxi from arima to port of spain and you're talking to people in the maxi taxi you're not going to use your jargon yeah that is unique to your company you're not going to use technical language you're not going yeah, to you use... know acronyms and yeah. yeah no i always tell people sit, tell me like you're telling your granny that way we exactly. know that it's, you know, it's something that is universally yeah. acceptable. Exactly. It might be technological. It might be complicated. Make it simple. And if you can't make it simple, then you don't understand it well enough. You don't. You don't. And I'm not yeah. by no means saying dumb it down. It's not yeah. a dumb it down. No, it's it is make speaking it accessible. in simple language. Yeah. Make the language accessible so that, so that people don't feel excluded by virtue of just the, lang the language. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is a really, really good point. So then tell me, then you went to, to uh, TCL. Yes, then I went to TCL. So TCL gave me my, my first foray into Caribbean, into the Caribbean space, mm -hmm. because TCL is a Caribbean company mm -hmm. uh, with offices in, in Jamaica, Barbados, and Anguilla at the time. I don't know what if they've expand, expanded now, but... They've been uh, taken then, over by another by another company yes, that they, is completely, yeah. completely, completely regional. Yeah, completely. Exactly. Like so everywhere they have a footprint. Exactly. So it's different now. But then mm -hmm. that is what it was. And so it's my experience, my first experience uh, dabbling in the regional space. And I had to learn very quickly because uh, the company had offices in in these other markets, so I had to make sure that I was able to communicate uh, to the various stakeholders, especially the media, which was a key part of of, mm -hmm. of my position. And uh, um, so, get to know who's who's in the market, uh, who are the government officials, who are the media, uh, who are the critical persons that that we need to know, uh, etc. So that that put me into that space, and then. Uh, Coca-Cola came calling and uh, they uh, headhunted me and I went there as the public relations 
uh, manager for the Caribbean. So, so this is Coca-Cola International. And uh, uh, I had a reporting line. I had a, a Caribbean boss. I had a Costa Rican boss. I had a Mexican boss. And I had a one in Atlanta. Mm. So I was serving different different beasts. <laughs> I, I <laughs> almost, I almost in, want in, to in the ask most respectful that, yeah, of way. Course, yeah, but I, yeah. you know, I almost want to ask, like, what was that challenge like? Because I just feel like when organizations just de, de, um, create these structures, that that it just to me never makes any sense because it's so complicated, <laughs> and you you know. You're serving this, and I'm sure all lovely people, but this four-headed beast, um, mm -hmm. it, it is bound to get difficult. But how do you how do you manage communications for family planning versus banking versus cement versus beverages? And how do you get the depth of knowledge about that particular industry so that you can communicate simply and clearly and, and without barriers? across so many different industries. Mm -hmm. But first you have to know the business. So each time I had a new chapter in my journey, my first task, even though I've always been thrown into the deep end, but my first task was always, I need to learn this business quickly. Mm. Now I will never, and 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 you never really get to, to do a deep dive into the business, but deep mm -hmm. enough for you to understand the business. So you need to understand the the the, the business that you're working in, mm -hmm. you, and then apply the communication concepts to that particular business. There is no one quick fix for every company. There's not an umbrella approach. You have to target, you have to customize your communications for each business. So by understanding the, the business and its needs, then you are able to customize your communications to suit. Now, the thing about it is that I have, and I've learned this in Coca-Cola, uh, Coca-Cola, one of their mantras was to always uh, think from the outside in mm. because the company operates globally there were some fundamental uh, um, generalized approaches to communication, mm -hmm. but it was always guided by the market that you're in. Yeah. So That's if good. you Can don't- you Incredibly yes, customized, yeah? Exactly, because you, so you know what the company wants, but you have to communicate it in the way that is relevant to that market. Yeah. That 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 not only the the what the customers want in that market, but what the bottling plants in each market requires. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able. So it's 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 two two approaches because you have to go through the bottle the bottlers as we call it. Um, back then and uh, so which is the manufacturing plants in each market mm -hmm. so you have to to work with them and target the the general coca-cola themes and topics and issues through them to get to the customers so there was levels of customization Mm -hmm. as you move along and every single market was different oh wow and the thing about and how it many is markets that did you cover i handled the entire english-speaking caribbean so for people so, who yeah so for people who don't know how many islands that would be um hmm. i don't even want to guess now i haven't i can't remember <laughs> i don't know i i think it's like ooh, i don't know I I don't want to guess and, and, and guess wrong. Oh well, I, you know, at, at one point I covered I covered um the English speaking Caribbean for, for Lyme and at the time it was 14 different territories. So it's at least 14 different markets with very, very different yeah, uh, yeah. perspectives and ways of doing yeah. things and um yeah. ways of communicating. And right now we have 
we represent the company I work for, we represent 28 uh, Caribbean countries, most of which are in English speaking. So, okay. so, you know, it could be somewhere between- <laughs> somewhere So between somewhere 14 between and 14 and 28. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And given that yeah. it was Coca-Cola, it was a lot. It would have been a yeah. lot. Yeah, it would be, it yeah. would be. And, and and the thing about it, I mean, some were, some were larger markets than the others, so. Right. And, so and, and there are mm-hmm. people who think, you know, the Caribbean is, is, is ubiquitous and, and, you know, everybody's the same. It, it could not be more different, you know, yeah. the way that we speak, the way that we, we sound, the, the things that we care about, as much as we share a lot in common, we are as, as similar as we are different. And, and, and as you think, culturally, every market is different. Yeah. And that is the that is the upside and downside to working with an international company. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they tend to think that the Caribbean, you know, is one big market yeah, and market. everybody's we, the same yeah. and we're not, you know, so that was always, if you ask me, what was my biggest challenge working there uh, was just that. Yeah. Just for them to understand that that Jamaica is very different to Barbados. That is very different to Trinidad and Tobago. That's very different to St. Lucia, you know. To St. Vincent, to St. Kitts, to Grenada, to Bahamas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think because we're small markets, it's easy to kind of say, oh, well, we'll just treat them all the same. But that's 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 a a very effective way of ensuring your decline. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> well, these large companies, it doesn't happen like that. But yes, yeah. it, 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 it's all, it was always a challenge. Always. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine. Yeah. And it's still a challenge because they are now our, one of our clients, Coca-Cola. Okay. So, okay. So, <laughs> so we, well, it's full we'll circle. Nice Coca-Cola. Yes. Yeah. So I am, and I'm, so I'm still trying to get the, the new ones in, in the same seat that succeeded me. Mm-hmm. to understand that it's still not that yeah 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 and and it's not even as though it's in a straight line so that let's say everybody's different and everybody's proceeding in that difference there are things that are changing there are different influences that are impacting these markets and so these markets are ever evolving in That's their right. differences so you're dealing with yeah. a lot of different markets that are continuing to evolve and you have to stay on the pulse of what is now Otherwise, it gets away from you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you, in that context, coach leaders on, you know, PR and crisis communications? How do you, what are some of the things that, listen, if you know nothing else, this is what you should know? One of the things is what tone do you want to set? Mm. at the point of the crisis because the the thing about crisis crises Mm. is that it is expected because we work with large organizations Mm -hmm. so i'm talking in the that context of of working with large organizations yeah uh, multinationals Caribbean based and and locals yeah and people expect those companies to have crisis Mm -hmm. that is not what shocks people yeah what shocks people is how you respond to the crisis yes so that is one of the 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 biggest challenges that or the aha moments that quite a few organizations um, get when we start working with them. Yeah, Richard Branson tells this amazing story um, in in The Virgin Way. Um, I think that's that's the book. I've I've read a lot of his books. But he talks about this amazing story of there being a train crash and, you know, just figuring out how to deal with it. And he was on holiday at the time. And he was like, I have to get there. And then there was a snowstorm. And so he's driving from one city to another city in the snowstorm because he has to get to the site of that crash because people have have been injured. And and so he's like, 
I, I will not, he said, forget about what others might think. I will not forgive myself if I am not there in this time of crisis. I have to be seen. I have to be out front and center. It can't be that we're only out front and center when it's, when it's time for accolades, when there is grief and when there is, um, when there's a crisis, you know, I have to be seen and I have to, people have to know that I care. Yeah. And that, that tells me two things. Well, one is that people see him as the face of the brand. Of course. Yeah. And in 2022, especially coming out of COVID, leadership across the board in large organizations they're all, especially the CEOs and those are right under the CEO or considered leadership, they are the face of the brand. Yeah. A couple of years ago, that was not so. You know, it the, the brand the, could have held it, itself within the organization. So it doesn't matter who is at the helm. Yeah. Things have changed. People now expect leaders to be seen. They have to speak, they have to communicate, yeah. and they have to communicate regularly. Yeah. So that is now, that that is the space that we're in, and that is what leadership has to get. So when you're in a crisis, you have to come out and say something. Yeah. So some might say, okay, well, I don't have anything to say. Yes, you do. Yes, because listen, we don't know what's happening right now, but this is this is the next, exactly. exactly. Oh my gosh, listen to me. You have now hit the nail on the thing that absolutely infuriates my life in, in business. Because they're like, oh, well, there's nothing to say. I said, so it means that you're done with it. You're not doing anything. You have nothing more to do. I'm like, no, we're going to check in. And I was like, oh, are you going to check in? So you can tell them you're going to check in. When are you going to check in? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to check in in a couple of hours. So put a time on it and tell them I'm going to check in. And then if there is something yeah. to tell at that point, I will let you know. If there's not anything to tell at that point, I will also let you know. And then I'll let you know when I check in again. But mm -hmm. it can't be that there's nothing to tell because you, you, you haven't planned to, to run away and hide. So you have no. to say something. And, yeah. and that's the thing, just, just being able to, to keep the lines of communication open. And like from the time somebody has to contact you to ask you about a problem you have lost because they believe you've forgotten them. Because they had to reach out to you and you didn't reach out to them proactively. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you've lost the opportunity to shape the narrative. Of course. You know, course. Or so, I mean, that, that's, so what I just said irritates me to the bone because, but it's, it's a true statement. Yeah. So people are, oh, we have to get in front of the story. We have to shape the narrative. You can't shape a narrative you can't get in front of a story with a press release mm -hmm. only right of course with very little information by the way of course of course right and and then you're upset that that you it's haven't... gotten away from you yeah yeah <laughs> it's gotten and away from also, you and there are also those leaders and i will not call any names but in the time of crisis they get indignant like what do they expect and I'm like they expect leadership they expect yeah, responses yeah. they expect you to, yeah. to own the issue and they expect you to help them feel safe and feel calm mm -hmm. and that is and that you don't you don't get to that from a place of of hubris you get to that by displaying vulnerability and saying listen this is what I know and this is what I don't know and there may be some things I can't tell you but yeah. here's where we are. And I mean, yeah. and I'm not saying that, that I am a perfect example of that, but I'm just saying that is the kind of leadership that I have received well. When somebody is, is authentic enough to say, listen, this is what I know and this is what I don't know. And there may be some things I can't share with you. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I respect that. I understand that. Not everybody's going to understand, but I understand that. Treat me like a grown up and I will behave like a grown up. When you find people acting like children, it's because they've been treated like children and nobody's telling them anything and then they get upset. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you've said it way better than I would. So, <laughs> that's not, exactly. Not at all. <laughs> no, it, it just gets very, very frustrating when, you know, and, and I think if there's one thing that I want all of us to get is that in, in times of, of challenge or crisis, 
if you are working on the problem, there is always something to share. There is always yeah. something to share. Even yeah. if it is, I don't know, but here's the next thing I plan to do to find out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and at the same time, you're still listening to your legal of advice. Of course. Yes. But, yes, yes. but you can still communicate. Yes. And you can come out and say, listen, I care. I care. You mm -hmm. know? And I mm -hmm. realize that that the industries and the, the roles that I would have held may have not been as high stakes as some of these other leaders who are who feel backed into a corner but I definitely feel that if you operate from a place of well I need to stick within the legal ramifications of the law and and yes you absolutely should but if you use that as an excuse not to find a way to connect with people during these times and be human about be it human oh my god yeah so, yeah. so beautiful so beautiful yeah. Yeah. you know yeah Mm -hmm. nobody's expecting somebody with a cape to fly in no no and that is the thing and and that is that is the the that has always been the challenge where it's really how you respond yeah people yeah. understand when there is a crisis because it's the nature of your business yeah give whatever business you're talking about there there could be some level of crisis there yeah that's not the issue is how you respond yeah. And I think a lot of a lot of leaders fear criticism so much that they rather say nothing than be criticized. But you know what? Guess what? You will be criticized regardless. Yeah. yeah. You might as well take criticism for something that you're proud of. Yeah. And that that you were that authentic you own, with. That you are authentic with. Yeah. 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 That yeah. you can go home mm -hmm. and sleep and think, you know what? I have no issues with how that went down. People mm -hmm. can say what they want to say. I feel good about it because I feel like I did my best and I showed that I cared and, and, and I am doing what I know to be right for the people. Yeah. 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 And, and that level also has to be that tone. Once it's set at the top, you find it will trickle throughout the organization and that the, the tone of the organization will change over time. That's such a good point. So I'm going to ask you a tricky question now because that dynamic, and I know, you know, you came to me, Lisanne, because one of the leaders that I most revere recommended you and she recommended you as someone who coached her. And I was like, well, listen, if you coached her, then I'll follow behind you anywhere because she <laughs> is like top of the top of the top. She thing. is, she is. So when when we think about this this authenticity and this humanness and this crisis communication you know i i don't want to to discount the fact that women are often held to a much higher standard and the women who rise to the top of the corporate ladder normally do so by being sometimes a bit more muted and and less less sort of emotionally available because you know, we're not the ones who've set the game, but we have to play as it's laid. So you'll find a lot more leaders who are female leaders who are, you know, mirroring men sometimes mm -hmm. in their in their sort of how they present. And so how do we look at crisis communication through a gender lens? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say communications on a whole. Mm -hmm crisis would be yeah. uh, uh, another aspect mm -hmm. yeah you know so the I would say so I've said it uh in terms of coaching many female executives the examples are around you the you take what you want to take and you choose to disregard what you don't want mm -hmm. and if it helps if it is that that um all around you are men, then what what can I learn from this process in order to assert myself within the boardroom? Mm -hmm. And and then use that to your advantage. I don't necessarily say mirror men or or, or do like what the men do, but you know, it's around you. So use those okay. as examples. But beyond that, know your worth. 
know your value. And unfortunately, this comes up a lot when I'm coaching female executives. There's a reason why you are placed in this position. Mm. Your talent, your skills, your you know, qualifications, Philosophy. your experience, <laughs> everything is packaged for a reason. And you were placed in this position for a reason. So nothing is wrong with asserting yourself and, and, and not accepting anything that devalues you in any way. Yeah, trust the process that got you there. Even exactly. If, even while continuing to work on, on improving and continuing to be better and trying to meet the moment that you're currently in. Because sometimes All right. um, what got you there won't keep you there. But, won't keep you there. Yeah, but you have to figure that out. So I want to end on the best piece of advice you've been given. The best piece of advice that I've been given. Know your worth. Okay. Know your worth. Know your value. Stop allowing the work to speak for you at all times. Mm. You have to, you have to know when to say this is part of a team. Our work speaks for ourselves. And then you have to know when you have to say, I led this team. And with my leadership, we were successful. Mm, to take and credit. that, that yeah. is the, and you have to, so it may come across as selfish. It may come across as arrogant. It may come all, come across as, as whatever negative thing that you want to think. But it's part of you asserting yourself because People, you can't expect people to know what you've done yeah. if you don't say if it. If you don't tell them, oh my goodness, I think that's such a like a chronic issue in in, yes. in female leadership is that we yeah. want to make sure everybody gets credit and and then we expect people to just know without ever saying what we were able to accomplish. Absolutely exactly. true. And such a fantastic note to end on. Yeah. Lisa Ann, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure thank to you. talk to you. And I'm thank definitely going to get in touch with you about a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you Absolutely. so much for having me. I really appreciate this. I'm glad that the that the um technological gods allowed us to have this allowed us to have this conversation. You guys don't know how challenging it was. <laughs> We had many mishaps. Murphy was active in this in this dialogue, but I'm glad. But Murphy did not conquer. No, it didn't, because we are we have stick to itiveness, and we decided yeah. that listen, we know our worth, and we're yep. going to do what we know we need to do. For sure, fabulous. Thank you all so much, and please be sure to like and subscribe and comment on the video. We are available on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, and we look forward to hearing your recommendations for other leaders that we should interview. And we look forward to speaking to you again. Bye. Bye.